I'm going to speak today about um, <clears throat> broadly what uh, what I've been doing in my PhD. So that's going to be the first part of the talk, uh, which is uh, essentially using an N-dimethyltryptamine or DMT, which is a very powerful, potent psychedelic drug, um, as a way to understand what are the neural correlates uh, of the psychedelic experience. Um, so under understanding the psychedelic experience through this unique specific compound, which is DMT. Uh, and what we've learned so far um, in that domain. Um, and also introduce a bit how we've approached the study of um, non-ordinary states of consciousness via DMT by employing a neurophenomenological approach. And in the last part of the talk, uh, also mention how that um, essentially what um, not only me, but uh, a, a group, a collective, uh, including uh, Professor Larise uh, here, uh, and also Olivia, uh, we developed uh, a manuscript from a, a specific conference on how to approach non-ordinary states of consciousness uh, via a discipline research program. And that model, uh, we call it a neurophenological approach to non-ordinary states of consciousness involving meditation, hypnosis, and psychedelics. So I'm also going to speak a bit about that um, and trying to bridge it more specifically with the psychedelic work, which is uh, my field of research and, and my primary work. Um, so, yes, that's it. Let's get started. So... Um, a bit of a background uh, information on psychedelics, which I think is quite relevant, uh, something regarding how the culture has approached the psychedelic experience and how that has shifted in the past years. <clears throat> so up until fairly recently, up until 20 years, um, psychedelics were referred mostly as hallucinogens, meaning a drug which induces hallucinations, uh, induces delusions, and that has somehow, in the past 20 years, shifted uh, in a fairly dramatic way uh, to consider them uh, from a scientific perspective. Officially, the taxonomy used now is psychedelics. Uh, psychedelic means literally um, the manifestation of the mind, psyche. Um, and although hallucinogens was the commonplace word to refer to these uh, compounds, before these past 20 years, in the past 20 years, psychedelics is now the, you know, the, the, the accepted term, which is quite interesting, quite revealing as well on, on the appraisals that the current scientific culture has regarding these experiences and what do they mean. Uh, we'll delve a bit deeper into that. And finally, um, uh, in the past, even more recent than that, uh, and this is very well embodied by this book by Michael Pollan, a very influential author, the idea of these compounds as transformative compounds uh, or these compounds as inducing experiences which have a transformative quality uh, to them. So uh, also, again, uh, giving a bit of context, uh, always important, I think, to mention that the use of psychedelics within research um, is also comes from its own background, its own history to a certain extent. Um, some archaeological evidence suggests that psychedelics have been used for millennia, uh, millennia, thousands of years, or maybe hundreds of years. It's, there's a, a debate as well on that, but what is fairly certain is that they have been used outside of these contemporary times, and their use has survived over the years. And it seems that human beings have a specific relationship with these experiences uh, and that that has been sustained over time. Um, so always important, I think, to, to remind oneself why, why it is relevant to study psychedelics, I think, in, in a contemporary field of research uh, re related to consciousness also bears relevance to this specific aspect that if we want to understand human beings and their conscious experiences, we cannot leave out these specific experiences. So we have evidence suggesting that mescaline has been used for 5,000 years, um, psilocybin for 500 years, and the use of DMT 
uh, or N and dimethyltryptamine, which is what I'm going to focus most of the talk, uh, there's evidence for over 4,000 years. Uh, that evidence concerns mainly its use in South America. Um, uh, they found tablets that have remnants of, of uh, snorted DMT. But maybe you are more familiar with its more recent and very popular use of DMT, which is contained in the ayahuasca vine. Uh, in this photo here, you can see a preparation of ayahuasca, uh, which includes the vine, but also chacruna. This is a plant with a plant with, uh, and this has been used in the Amazon. There's evidence for hundreds of years of use. And now extremely popular uh, outside of the Amazon uh, in European countries. You hear about shamans traveling around, uh, facilitating these experiences. And um, it's part of an ongoing um, cultural shift to the acceptance of these substances and what do they mean. Um, so when we speak about classic psychedelics, um, we speak about a specific set of substances. Uh, the most paradigmatic of these concerns psilocybin, which is the compound present in magic mushrooms, lasting around six hours, LSD lasting around 10 hours, or DMT um, lasting only 10 minutes when injected or smoked. Uh, the way that we give it in the lab is injected it's intravenous administration of DMT. It's a very short acting drug and therefore an ideal way to map these transitions of consciousness. How does the system becomes fully immersed in this altered status of consciousness and how does it go back into its normal ways of working into if you want, if you want consensus reality, consensus uh, um, ways of experiencing the world. And also mescaline, uh, lasting around 12 hours. Mescaline is, is the main compound found in the peyote cactus, for example, in North America, but also San Pedro cactus in South America and Central America. Uh, these uh, compounds, the ones that we refer to as classic psychedelics, uh, they, are, they act specifically or very importantly in the serotonin system as a primary target. As you can see here, the serotonin molecule is very similar to the psilocin molecule. Psilocin is the metabolite of psilocybin. So once psilocybin is ingested, it transforms into psilocin, and that is the actual active compound. Um, and more specifically, uh, we know now that a necessary pharmacological mechanism, not necessarily sufficient, but certainly necessary, is the activation of the serotonin 2A receptor by these compounds. Uh, if we administer, we, we pre-treat with a 5-HT2A uh, antagonist, a blocker like ketanserine, before administering a psychedelic, we inhibit um, the psychedelic psychological effects. And that has been shown with psilocybin, has been shown with um, ayahuasca or DMT. And I think it also has been shown with LSD. I'm not entirely sure, but we know fairly well that this affinity, the the, the stickiness that these compounds have uh, with regards to the serotonin 2A, the 5-HT2A receptor, is primary to its uh, psychological effects. So this 5-HT2A receptor, because of that, is always sometimes referred to as this psychedelic receptor. Um, its function and relevance has been mostly discovered via LSD, psilocybin, and other psychedelics. Um, also, the interesting to note, I think, the agonism of the 5-HT2A receptor was also is considered by some to be um, an important development in the field of psychiatry uh, when people were trying to assign function uh, to different neurotransmitters. Um, when LSD was found, the, the structural similarity of the molecule was seen as being similar to the serotonin. And then they saw that LSD had a particularly interesting effect um, in conscious experience was that people started also to find out more about what serotonin is doing in the brain. So uh, I think it's an interesting piece of trivia that, that psychedelics have also played a part in the development of some aspects of psychiatry. Um, its 5 ac 2 a receptor is widely present throughout the central nervous system, but it's especially present in the neocortex. 
the prefrontal cortex, temporal cortex, but also in more early sensory areas like the primary visual cortex or V1, very dense expression of uh, the 5 hc 2 a receptor. Uh, an important aspect also is that um, current models of understanding is that um, following the activation of the 5 hc 2 a receptor, glutamate is released, uh, glutamate the main uh, excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain and therefore leading to enhanced synaptic plasticity or functional plasticity. Um, we'll cover that a bit as well later in the talk. Um, and the 5 c 2 a receptor has a role in memory, attention, and specifically learning. Um, a lot of uh, animal work, preclinical work involving the 5 c 2 a receptor uh, shows that it may play a crucial role in the development of new patterns of behavior in animals, but also the unlearning of established patterns and behaviors, which probably also bear relevance to the clinical potential of psychedelics for, for example, addictive behaviors. And we'll also go into that in a bit. So what are the psychological effects of not only psilocybin, but psychedelics in general? Just as a brief introduction, uh, we can think of visual distortions and visual imagery uh, that can happen with eyes open or eyes closed. So in eyes open, people talk about these traces, the, the morphing of images in the room or in the environment. Uh, when people have their eyes closed, they report usually um, seeing pattern, geometrical patterns, fractal patterns, but also at higher doses and experiences like the one that I'm gonna speak in a bit, the one of DMT, people also report the operation of these complex visual images, um, these very engaging, immersive experiences uh, in which the content of that experience is populated by meaningful uh, or semantically relevant content. So not just simple geometrical or fractal patterns, but uh, for example, eyes, cities, faces, objects, people, etc. Another classic effect of psychedelics is the hyper association of ideas, leading possibly to enhanced creativity. Uh, if you win, if you want to think about it more informally, the idea of connecting different dots that previously were not connecting, allowing for the formation of novel ideas. Also, this idea of hyper association of ideas when people are having challenging psychedelic experiences has been linked to the um, appearance of forms of delusion or forms of um, things similar to a paranoid reaction. Uh, for example, in a psychotic break, usually these are resolved very fast, but uh, the current understanding is that it involves a very similar mechanism as the one in creativity or enhanced creativity, the idea that people are somehow generating novel connection between ideas and novel connections um, of meaning are therefore leading to uh, forms of uh, distress and delusions at times. Um, changes in bodily awareness, uh, this can go both ways. So people can feel in a state of disembodiment, no longer inhabiting their bodies or an increased sense of perception of the actual body. Time distortions, uh, a very interesting phenomenological uh, aspect of the psychedelic experience, but not um, sufficiently studied. Um, and finally, what you might call these higher order or high level effects of psychedelics, uh, the capacity of these compounds to induce mystical type, spiritual peak, or what some people refer to as non-dual experiences. And very related to that, the phenomenology of ego dissolution or self Solution uh, very important um, in the field of consciousness research, as we will see in a bit. So, what have we done to understand this? At least, what has concerned my specific role in this, in which I have been studying the effects of a specific uh, psychedelic, a uh, one that induces a particularly immersive, strong psychedelic experience, one that can be considered a very useful way to understand the psychedelic experience because at regular doses it mimics uh, what happens at very high doses with psilocybin or very high doses with LSD. And when that happens, when the experience is particularly engaging, we see a phenomenology which is conformed by especially pronounced elementary imagery like 
geometries and fractals, but also engage in complex imagery. While at the same time, people are referring a state of enhanced disembodiment. Um, sometimes this is referred to participants as a sense of expanding beyond the limits of the body, uh, or at times um, I was no longer aware of my body at all. So more of a blunting sort of effect. Um, but broadly speaking, the idea is that when people are engaged in this very immersive content, rich experiences, very visually engaging, very emotionally engaging, uh, bodily awareness appears to drop out. And this recalls very much, uh, the notion that these experiences can be somehow analogous to an induction of a virtual reality state, not necessarily the one the virtual reality that we have available via technology these days in which some people might argue is insufficient to have the level of immersion that a DMT experience has, but more in the level of the concept of an idea of virtual reality in which uh, a, a reality, an environment is somehow simulated while the person is somatically disengaged from its immediate environment. And this disengagement in a bodily sense from the immediate environment apparently allowing the possibility of engaging in a virtual state or a virtual world. Uh, and this is of course, very similar also when we, when we can think about it to the idea of dreaming in which our current or our usual way with engaging with the external environment and sensory input is disrupted and we generate endogenously driven sensory input uh, consisting of these very rich and engaging visual worlds. So um, we're going to go a bit into this, what have we found in terms of neurological evidence and phenomenological evidence indicating that DMT can be a form of virtual reality of sorts. Uh, this is just to give you a, a bit of hints for those of you who are wondering how this experience feels like to a certain extent, at least the visual component appears to be uh, engaging in this manner. Um, the idea that people see fractal geometries and these patterns are somehow engaging to the participant, not only the special component as it looks now, but people actually feel transported, they feel immersed, many times even surrounded by these geometries or these geometries are even coming from their bodies. There's a, a level of participatory engagement with the visual component of the experience. Um, we found that in the most intense part of this DMT experience, which is around three minutes after we inject the compound, uh, we found that uh, in terms of brain rhythms or, or brain wave patterns, the alpha, alpha drops out in a very, very significant fashion. And that correlates very strongly with the intensity, with the subjective intensity of the experience. And while this alpha, this apparently very non-specific marker of alpha is dropping out, we see increases in low, low, uh, in low frequency rhythms like delta and theta. Also following the intensity of the experience, um, very reminiscent as well uh, with some components of dreaming or sleep. Uh, the idea that the normal alpha dominant rhythm pattern drops out while these lower frequencies start to become more prominent. And this has now been replicated in um, a couple more studies, including a naturalistic study uh, um, looking into the brain effects of DMT, but also our recent EEG fMRI uh, study in which we're about to submit our findings. Uh, and we found that DMT, apparently DMT, uh, compared to other psychedelics, apparently when the psychedelic experience is very, very engaging, uh, we're seeing these delta increases. Um, uh, this is quite interesting because at least from, from the point of view, and, and possibly, you know, much better than me, this, the idea that delta has been classically conceived as a marker for unconsciousness seems to run contrary to our findings. And, um, maybe this is an instance in which. Uh, psychedelic uh, research can provide uh, interesting ways of of assessing this into broader fields of consciousness practice, like, for example, 
when dealing with states of reduced consciousness and EEG markers for that. Uh, so our findings, together with other findings, looking at these increases in delta while people remain conscious but in an altered state, has led to the idea that this delta more than a marker of unconsciousness or lack of consciousness may be better understood as a state of conscious disconnection from the external environment. And this has been put forward also quite recently in a, in a paper by Joel Froelich. Um, We can also think of the DMT as well as a, as a powerful way to examine the, the state of ego dissolution, self dissolution. Um, the idea of the sense of self being uh, a very important aspect of conscious experience. The idea is that with psychedelic drugs, we can perturb that sense of self. Uh, and via perturbation, we can understand um, what are the neural mechanism underpinning the sense of self. And also, what are the specific phenomenological features that compose an ordinary sense of self? What is broken down when this happens? And what, how, what does that tell us about conscious experience? Um, so in our, in our studies, um, in collaboration also with, with other researchers um, who are very uh, well trained in, in how to explore the, the structure of the DMT experience via these methods like like microphenomenology, uh, we've been able to disentangle specific aspects of the experience. And one of them concerns the state of disembodiment. Um, as you can see, the DMT experience at the beginning is, is very intense. People, people feel a, a very strong rush all over their bodies, but as that is immediately followed by a state of absolute disconnection from the body. Uh, the body drops out entirely while this very immersive state of consciousness with visual imagery uh, starts to increase. So that led us to think that maybe, um, maybe there is a relationship between a state of bodily awareness and maybe interoceptive mechanisms related to this state of disembodiment. Um, and maybe that the DMT experience of disembodiment is somehow associated with reduced interoceptive awareness. The idea here is that the sense of self is constructed in a hierarchical fashion, starting from the interoception of our internal organs. Um, that is somehow an awareness. This is, there's, this is an ongoing debate of whether or not we are uh, always somehow semi-consciously aware of these uh, homeostatic mechanisms of uh, associated with interoception or whether or not they only became salient when something breaks down. Um, regardless of that, we wanted to test whether or not we can find neural markers of reduced interoceptive awareness in the DMT state and whether or not can be the basis or the experience of ego dissolution or self dissolution. So tapping into the idea of the hierarchical sense of self by using psychedelic drugs. So for this, we use the heart evoked potential. Uh, for those of you not aware of this, the heart evoked potential is a ERP event related um, potential. Um, uh, that is uh, essentially it's, uh, many people argue it's, it's a marker that occurs in the cortex very specifically also in the right insula uh, with every heartbeat somehow signaling a degree of interoceptive awareness happening in the cortex uh, so it's like a heart brain connection marker and we found that it's significantly reduced in the dmt experience and sp uh, specifically reduced in areas related to interoceptive awareness including the right insula but also the right uh, supplementary motor area and this uh, reduction of this marker in the right supplementary motor area correlating uh, with feelings of disembodiment but also with feelings of ego dissolution uh, so very much in line with the idea maybe a connection here pointing towards the notion that in these psychedelic states the experience of ego dissolution could be subversed by a very primary elementary mechanism related to uh, bodily awareness or interoception more specifically. Another thing that uh, 
we've used the DMT experience to understand is how do these uh, experiences relate to uh, current uh, explanations of uh, how the brain operates uh, related to predict, uh, predictive coding or predictive uh, processing. So more specifically, uh, we wanted to test a recent theory put forward that um, the psychedelic experience uh, fundamentally is a state in which the influence of priors is minimized when comparing to normal waking experience. The idea from the point of view of predictive coding or predictive processing is that our engagement with the world is fundamentally um, dominated by our predictions, our models of the world, our theories, our stories of the world, and that uh, the engagement with bottom-up sensory input or error signals is essentially an error signal allowing us to update our models and uh, increase the accuracy of our predictions of our models of our stories. The idea would be that the psychedelic state would allow some form of plasticity and maybe even some form of long-term transformations by shifting the balance in which these priors are no longer being as dominant as they usually are uh, and instead we have now uh, inputs of sources from lower level uh, sensory or lower level emotional areas or even memory areas and therefore provide uh, forms of therapeutic efficacy to some extent. So we tested this uh, by using DMT. Uh, we tested the idea that this has been recently proposed that you can examine top-down predictions by looking at backward traveling waves assessed via EEG and um, bottom-up sensory input error signals via forward waves also assessed uh, via EEG. And we specifically found very uh, in line with, uh, with the theory that DMT reduces the influence of backward traveling waves in a very significant fashion while increasing these forward traveling waves um, very much in line with this idea that uh, there's a form of relaxed priors in the psychedelic state. Um, the, the third part uh, of what we found in terms of um, what is DMT doing in the brain and how maybe this relates um, to the psychedelic experience is that we found that DMT particularly seems to act in these more evolved brain areas. Uh, areas in the neocortex and these systems. Um, so specifically our fMRI work involving DMT has shown that DMT induces a state of um, hyperconnectivity in high level networks. So default mode networks and front parietal networks with the rest of the networks. Um, while we see somewhat of a disengagement between lower level networks, between the somatomotor network and the visual network. So integration between higher order networks and the rest of the brain and decreased connectivity between lower level networks. And when using measures of global connectivity, so this is a, a measure called global functional connectivity. It has also been called functional connectivity density. Um, the idea here is that you parcelate the brain and then you measure the degree of connectivity between each area of the brain and all other areas of the brain in average. So this gives you a global connectivity uh, number index, if you will, R value, correlation value uh, of hyperconnectivity of each area of the brain. And we see that uh, we find hyperconnectivity specifically pronounced in higher level areas of the brain, uh, specifically pronounced in the prefrontal cortex, in the temporal parietal junction, and also in temporal areas. Um, and our EEG fMRI findings are also very much in line with this. Uh, when we look at the correlation between delta waves and the degree of hyperconnectivity, we see increases particularly pronounced in this specific systems. The inverse we see with alpha waves and hyperconnectivity in these higher order areas in the brain, and also the entropy. Uh, with entropy, uh, the specific marker we used for those of you interested, is Lempulsive uh, complexity. 
uh, lamp pulsive complexity looks at the variability of the signal after DMT has been injected. And we found that, that cha those changes in entropy were particularly pronounced in temporal and some frontal areas and at somewhat of a left lateralization in the brain, uh, very reminiscent of language areas. Um, and in fact, when you look, when we, when we put these maps into Neurosynth, if, uh, I don't know if you know Neurosynth, Neurosynth is a online platform in which you can upload your brain maps and it will do a form of like quick meta analysis of all other studies that have been uploaded in this platform and look at the most, um, uh, the, the, the most prominent terms associated to those studies. And we found that these hyperconnectivity maps of the psychedelic state induced by DMT appears to be particularly pronounced in these language and semantic related areas. And when we look at the 5HC2A receptor association with these maps, we find uh, very much the same pattern, uh, semantic link language areas, uh, listening areas, theory of mind, so social cognition and so on. And here on the right, you, you find a, a map from um, essentially the same ideas, a semantic areas in the brain from more concrete to more abstract semantic processing. And the idea is that the areas that become hyperconnected with DMT and psychedelics are more strongly associated with abstract semantic processing rather than concrete semantic processing. And possibly somehow indicating that DMT and psychedelics facilitate the generation of novel concepts, meaning making and uh, mentalization theory of mind. Uh, very much with this in, in line with this idea that um, this hyper connected state, this dot connecting state that occurs in the DMT experience, in the psychedelic experience, is facilitated by the engagement of abstract semantic functions, higher evolved areas of the brain rather than more lower level areas of the brain related to sensory information. And uh, also in line with this, we found that DMT has. Uh, very significant, significantly flattens the principal gradient of brain organization. So this is a, essentially an, an analysis uh, now very popularly used in which uh, the brain is somehow parsed between in a, in a specific gradient of brain connectivity and brain organization from unimodal brain areas to transmodal brain areas. Unimodal brain areas less evolved, more concrete, more lower level sensory areas. Transmodal areas more related to abstract semantic processing, to more evolved cognitive functions, and multisensory areas. So these findings indicate that DMT and psychedelics flatten the cortical hierarchy. They make these transmodal areas less differentiated from these unimodal brain areas. And all this appears to point towards the notion that DMT and psychedelics engage particularly resources from more evolved brain systems. Um, and this has been found in areas of psilocybin, LSD, and now with DMT, very similar uh, mechanisms. So this appears to indicate to some extent uh, that psychedelics acting on the 5-HC2A receptor um, induce a state of uh, brain plasticity by engaging these higher level systems, these more evolved brain systems. However, um, these the, the brain plasticity or, or the or the transformations at the brain level are not necessarily uh, an automatically beneficial transformation. Uh, they don't have an intrinsic therapeutic value. Um, before I gave the, even the example that in challenging experiences, in unfavorable context, it can even lead to. Uh, forms of traumatic episode, traumatic experiences, or even uh, psychotic breaks that can last transiently. Uh, but in the right context, we find very strong, important therapeutic benefits. And the idea here is that this brain mechanisms associated with the psychedelic state and the 5 hc 2 a receptor appear to indicate that psychedelics provide a window of opportunity for these transformative effects, for them to be safe and for them to be beneficial. 
So the window of opportunity is not necessarily a beneficial one, but highly depends on the context. And that context relates in a big way to what we now know of psychedelic practice, therapeutic practice more specifically. So the importance of having a good physical setting in which space and music uh, is somehow present. Uh, the characteristics of the patients are the right ones for that experience, for that therapeutic experience. And finally, the very fundamental and importance that the actions of a therapist have, how they manage the expectations before a session, how they, they help the patient make meaning out of that uh, specific experience after the experience has gone down appears to be very indicative of therapeutic efficacy. Um, so that's in the past and now in the future, we are currently employing DMT uh, in a continuous fashion. We're administering DMT not only as this bolus intravenous injection, but we're trying to extend it for over 30 minutes. The idea is that our phenomenological analysis of the structure of the DMT experience appears to indicate that this experience has two stages. One is corresponding to a lot of sensory engagement, engagement of sensory systems uh, in which people feel very immersed and they feel disembodied and so on. And then a second stage in which these experiences of sensory engagement are now elaborated, people are reflecting metacognitive systems start to be engaged. Um, and this appears to be also quite relevant to psychedelic practice to a certain extent. So if you look at something like a psilocybin experience, um, previous phenomenological work on the psilocybin experience indicates that the psilocybin experience is marked by uh, coming in and out of this immersive quality of the experience here referred to as transient peaks of self-transcendence uh, or ego dissolution. But at the same time, people refer to this idea that it comes in waves so that they can get out of the experience and then they come back in with the new learnings out of that elaborative process out of the peak into another peak and then they elaborate again and so on. With DMT, we cannot really do this is it seems to be a very biphasic short experience of immersion and elaboration. So by extending the DMT infusion for over 30 minutes, these are some of our preliminary findings. Uh, this is being led by uh, my PhD student, Lisa Luan. Uh, we can see that um, we can extend this experience and possibly engage uh, more experiential facets that can lead also to therapeutic outcome and also maybe even providing very exciting opportunities to personalize medicine. So if we have something like um, DMT continuously infused that can be targeted to the characteristics of the patient uh, and therefore provide, for example, a slow onset if needed uh, and a longer experience if needed, then it opens the door to a very dynamic, plastic, adaptable psychedelic experience. Uh, so, and I know I don't have much time, so I'm going to try to cover very fast our neurophenological work, uh, the one that we have recently done and submitted. Um, and this concerns essentially to the idea that non-ordinary states of consciousness appear to provide uh, some form of uh, spontaneous, what you might call in phenomenological um, practice, a bracketing of sorts. The idea is that these non-ordinary experiences, psychedelic experiences, meditation experiences, or hypnosis experiences, provide a parenthesis, a break, or a discontinuity from our ongoing engagement with the world. And in that discontinuity, something novel emerges. That can be a vision, that can be a form of insight, psychological insight, or even in more immersive experiences, a form of mystical revelation of sorts. Uh, the idea here is that these experiences appear to engage creative mechanisms um, and our, our main sort of, um, if you will, our main proposal here that, that we did with this specific framework we proposed is we wanted to find a unified framework to understand non-ordinary states of consciousness uh, more broadly. Uh, and non-ordinary states of consciousness, we specifically uh, refer to meditation, hypnosis, and psychedelics, but I think it can also apply to forms of trance, 
like the ones that you're studying in, in your lab. And the things that we propose specifically is that nonlinear states provide a window into structural and dynamics of experience and their neuronal counterparts. So as opposed to simply looking at the contingent aspect of experiences or specific aspects of the contents of experience, we are interested in understanding what are some of the more stable features of conscious experience and how can we understand them. We propose that NSCs, non-ordinary states of consciousness, provide a window into these structural aspects, uh, provide a, a spontaneous form of this parenthesis of experience, a perturbation of it, and allow us to understand it a bit better. Um, so they provide a window into the embedded nature of consciousness involving mind, body, brain, and context. Um, and that a neurophenomenological approach, more specifically, uh, grants us a unique opportunity to study the structural, dynamic, and embedded nature of conscious experience. Um, and finally, the idea is that this neurophenomenological approach uh, stresses also the importance of experience-based know-how for researching NSCs and applying NSC in, in clinical practice. Uh, so I'm going to go to each of these points very fast. If if I'm already over it, please do let me know, and I can just stop now if, if necessary. We can just focus on the first part of the talk. So um, we just... have at least thirty minutes left. Okay. So... Okay. Okay. If so, so if that's the case, then I'll, I'll just I'll then I'll, I'll quickly also refer to this uh, specific figure. So for example, to the left here, you have an ordinary state of consciousness. Uh, this is an experimental setting. A participant is viewing a stimuli in a computer doing a task. The stimuli is a yellow Pac-Man. Um, he is engaged in a context, but that context is somehow, uh, it's not usually under consideration uh, in, an, in an ordinary state of consciousness neuroscience experiments. Or if you will, the idea is that you would have enough variability in the characteristics of the of the participant or these contexts so that you could average out the the effect of the context so you want to like in a way you want to get rid of variability of context and just want to focus on how the stimuli affects the participant so you have a blurred context here uh, and that experience here shown in the bubble um, leading to a perception a specific perception and an emotional reaction uh, let's say red is rage, for example. Uh, the thing is that in an, ordinary, in an ordinary state of consciousness, you would have very limited opportunities to try to understand how the structure of experience is changing uh, when participants are perceiving this specific stimuli and reacting emotionally to it. So here you have the experience of contents can be magnified in the experience while the experience of the subject himself or reflexive awareness of that experience is somehow diminished or you can have a shift and people can now metacognitively engage by going in and out for example of a mind wandering task uh, the idea here is that probing into the structure of consciousness here understood as experiencing content subject or reflexive awareness is somehow limited in an ordinary state of consciousness However, when we have a non-ordinary state of consciousness, it appears that the context now becomes quite relevant. And there's a lot of research implying that this is the case with psychedelics. I'm going to refer to that research in a bit. Um, so now the context somehow becomes manifest. The experience, when people have the same stimuli, instead of just having few changes in states of consciousness, in the content of consciousness, you have now a varied range of perceptions and emotions. Let's say when people are having a psilocybin experience, they can view that specific object uh, with specific features, visual features, which can shift. Uh, for example, they can see the object morph. They can hallucinate uh, another object or contents related to that. Um, 
and also their emotional reaction can change. There, there appears to be a larger repertoire in the contents of consciousness available with the same stimuli. And the idea is that permutation of these different states of consciousness also leads to permutations of different structures of consciousness. So for example, you can have one in which the experience of content is magnified or another state of consciousness in which the experience in subject and reflexive awareness is magnified, let's say in a usual meditation session, focused tension, breathing meditation session. So the point essentially is that we have a broader range of repertoire for structures of consciousness and contents of consciousness in a non-ordinary state of consciousness approach. Uh, so the idea here is that the, what do we speak when we speak about neurophenomenology? We refer more specifically to uh, the work of uh, Francisco Arela and his research program that he did in the 1990s. He essentially proposed that when we try to approach the hard problem of consciousness, um, how can we understand the intimacy of subjective experience from a neuroscience perspective and the limitations of that, uh, instead of trying to reduce or eliminate subjective experience and explain it completely via a neuroscientific arguments, we try to include experience and its richness in our scientific discipline methods. Uh, and this is what he called, uh, in part, the idea of having a second person approach, a middle way between experience and biology, in which we have mutual constraints between first person subjective experience and third person neurobiological data. And the other big aspect related to this idea of um, uh, a neurophenomenological approach to non-ordinary states of consciousness regards this idea of how do we then include the nature of the subjective experience from a very disciplined perspective? How can we take experience seriously, if you will, and include it in our um, scientific methods? So one of the proposed methods is specifically the notion of, for example, microphenomenology, um, which is a way to mediate first person reports to reduce their bias to a certain extent and extract structural features of experience as opposed to being fixed on their contingent content aspects. Um, so for example, a microphenomenological interview, instead of focusing whether or not you hallucinated that there was a, a green alien entity when you smoked DMT, would be more interested in how that social interaction manifested and how, for example, that related to how your sense of self or how your embodied awareness might have changed during that experience. Um, so this is, for example, something that we've done on some of our research, some microphenomenological interview. This is a participant relating different facets of their experience via this method after the injection of DMT. And with this, we were able to extract different features um, and then the classifications of those features into structural aspects like bodily aspects, visual aspects, and emotional aspects, then leading finally to uh, what we saw was uh, more or less invariant uh, dynamic aspects of this experience. The idea that the visual element of the experience changed over time, how the bodily effects changed, and how metacognitive aspects uh, were engaged or disengaged throughout the experience. Uh, so another thing that we propose in this in this paper is that these NSCs provide, uh, if you want, an intuitive way to understand these um, uh, these structural aspects of consciousness. So, for example, the sense of self. Uh, so I mentioned before how psychedelics appear to disrupt the sense of self. Here we have um, a report from Michael Pollan, the author I mentioned before, from his. Uh, 5-methoxy-DMT experience, a very powerful psychedelic. He mentions different facets of the experience and how his sense of self was completely disrupted. Uh, and it, this is just a way to intuitively show how, for example, aspects uh, related to self-location, uh, the idea of having a sense of presence or a sense of reality and how it shifts, um, how time and space appear to be constitutive of our sense of self, 
which also goes away during this experience of ego dissolution. And finally, the bodily aspects pertaining the sense of self are disrupted. And the idea here is that psychedelics may provide a way into understanding that to a certain extent, the sense of self is possibly constructed by different features and we can perturb these features via a non-ordinary state of consciousness. And we are, if we are studying people in a scanner environment, we can also try to understand the brain mechanisms subverting those changes in experience. Another aspect we propose in this uh, specific approach is that NSCs provide a window into the embedded nature of consciousness involving mind, body, brain, and context. Um, so it appears that most research and application of NSCs um, appears to take into account the importance of contextual variables to ensure that safety is there in the practice, but also that it leads to beneficial outcomes. Uh, we refer to these contextual practices in the psychedelic sphere as set and setting. So set are variables relating to the person and setting are variables referring to uh, the physical context or the cultural context surrounding that experience. So for example, the way that worldviews, personality, motivations or intentions might change the quality of an experience or how a specific culture uh, how a specific lineage that is used in the application of the substance or that experience or the ritual devices or the facilitator or teacher how those facets are also crucial into determining what is the nature of that specific experience so that's what we call when we when we refer to context both set and setting i'm not going to go too much into into this because it's quite complex but the idea here is that at least from uh what we know from psychedelic experiences what we see is that there's now some form of evidence around the intuition that not only it appears to be that uh, you need to take into account these cultural or these contextual factors when people are having these uh, psychedelic experiences but that the very nature of the experience, the contents of the experience is particularly determined by the cultural context in which that experience unfolds. So for example, if somebody takes DMT um, in a research lab and they have read this book about how DMT allows you to communicate with entities and beings and maybe alien beings, people might refer to those alien beings as, as encountering them. Whereas if people take this experience in the Amazon and that in the Amazon, the, the narrative is that the DMT experience will allow you to communicate with spirits um, from the natural world. That is what will happen. So the idea is that the increased suggestion and suggestibility, and therefore context appears to be fundamental in that process. And finally, and this is the final thing to end, uh, the idea is that the neurophenomenological approach to NSCs or non-ordinary states uh, stresses the importance of experience-based know-how uh, for the research and application. Here, the idea is that, uh, for example, what we found in psychedelic practice is that uh, not only we found, but this is practiced not only by uh, now current psychedelic therapy, but also a lot of ritual devices used by shamans, for example, they use psychedelics, is that everything surrounding the experience, not involving the actual pharmacological intervention, is very much fundamental and that this is a practice that evolves over time. Um, so for example, uh, we now have, I'm gonna go over this, but essentially all these uh, apparent long lasting transformation in the brain and mind evolved by psychedelics and their clinical effects for the treatment of depression, um, for existential distress, incre uh, increasing well-being nature connectedness or social connectedness, they appear to be very much facilitated by uh, an optimal context in which the experience takes place. And more important than the content, or let's say a crucial feature of that context, a skillful facilitation. So um, an experienced therapist, an experienced guide, an experienced facilitator who has been through that experience and knows how to navigate it to a certain extent, and therefore is able to develop a know-how, uh, a way of embodied practice, if you will, to assist people navigating these experiences. 
So we propose that non-ordinary states of consciousness appears to be um, particularly susceptible to these forms of know-how so that their research and application is successful and uh, beneficial. And uh, just to end, I think on this notion of know-how, I think uh, we, we reach very much uh, a very crucial point as psychedelic experiences and psychedelic applications for novel therapeutic possibilities becomes very crucial. Um, the idea here is that evidence, uh, some form of evidence uh, shows that uh, the administration of psychedelics is not a magic bullet, if you will, uh, to treat any form of condition that it will be automatically beneficial, but it is actually very much dependent on context, the therapists, and skillful know-how so that that intervention is beneficial. And that's it. Thank you very much for, for your patience. This was kind of a long talk. I try to cram in a lot of uh, information, but I hope it was uh, clear enough.